dogs and hogs. And I was going to give it to you one shot, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it up, and I'll give you the second part next week. Now, beloved, this message has been based upon my conversations, believe me, when I tell you, with many pastors, with many professors, and especially seeing what's going on in our cemeteries, excuse me, seminaries, and what's going on in a lot of churches. And uh, uh, I was speaking to one that was in Las Vegas, and uh, my heart went out for this person, and when he told me what has happened, uh, he's only got about 30% of the people have come back from their COVID virus, and a lot of them have returned back into the world. Now, we know the Bible says in the last days that's going to happen. Amen? Now, the Apostle Peter here, beloved, through personal experience, Peter knows what it was to deny the Lord. He knows from persecution, and he knows by seeing temptation. That's why he says again and again, it's mindful that I put you in remembrance of these things. Do you hear that? We all want to hear new truths, but he says it's mindful that I put you in remembrance of these things because we have a tendency to forget, amen? We can get caught up in our life, we can get caught up in our jobs, and we do not understand what's going on. Peter's second epistle is packed with theology. I wish I could give it to you all. I can't. So it's going to be kind of a Bible study and kind of a preaching teaching because my job is to teach you the Word of God, amen? Amen? The message is entitled, Dogs and Hogs. I want you to open up your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Now, beloved, I want you to pay close heed. Remember, this is Peter who denied the Lord three times. So he's speaking from personal experience. He knows what's going on. He sees what has been happening to the church. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. He says, for if after they have escaped, now notice the air is past tense there. These people, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge, used seven times, I told you, in the book of, of um, 2 Peter, and that word epignosis, is uh, full, intimate knowledge of the Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. They are again, or once more, entangled therein and overcome. Now watch this. He says, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed or wallowing in the mire. The picture he's giving us, they return to that which they once rejected. He's giving us a picture of a backslider. He's giving us the picture of a carnal, worldly Christian. They return to the very things that God had delivered them from. Our Father and our God, as we consider this subject this morning, dogs and hogs, Holy Spirit of the living God, you're the blessed illuminator. Father, we pray for your presence, a strong anointing here today, Lord God, that you'd open up the word of God to us, and Lord, you would make it a reality. We'd see the seriousness of the times which we now live, the signs of the times. Father, anoint this preacher with feet of clay. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. Beloved, both the Lord and his apostle warns us and then, that in the last days, of Earth's history, there is going to be a final and great apostasy that is going to befall the church, and it's also going to befall the world. In other words, the church used to be the salt to the world, amen? And the world had some righteous principles, but we can see now from the top down, that's not true anymore, is it? But in the church, the kingdom of God, the visible manifestation of the kingdom of God is the church. The kingdom of God is invisible, but there has a visible manifestation of it, and it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the people. Now in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Paul said this. Listen, he said, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ's coming, shall not come, except there come an apostasia. Thayer says apostasia. An apostasia, falling away first, 
and then that man of sin, the son of perdition, be revealed. The word son of perdition there is used one other time in, in uh, John chapter 17, verse 11. It's used of Judas. He was a pseudo-apostle. So the Antichrist is going to be a pseudo-apostle. Amen? Someone in the church that looks like a real Christian, but he's not a real Christian. But he says that there's going to be a great apostasy in the last days. Do you remember when we started this church? I said, look to your left, look to your right. Remember we were crowded? I says, as we go along, you're going to look to your left, look to your right, and the people that you see here now won't be here anymore. Has that happened? Not only here. It's happened in a lot of churches. But you, the Lord and the apostles stated, beloved, that multitudes would go back into the world from the church. Multitudes would backslide. Multitudes would apostatize from the faith that they once not only professed, but they also possessed. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, Jesus said this, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He's not just talking about love in general in the world, like we don't love abort, uh, uh, infants enough that we're aborting them. That's certainly true. But he's talking about the love for Christ in the church. He's saying the love of Christ in the church, he said, is going to wax cold. We've seen in Laodicea, they grew lukewarm in the church. Amen? They got fat. They, got, they, they had food in the table. They had money in their pocket. They had everything going for them. But Jesus said, you make me sick. I'll vomit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. That's pretty serious business, isn't it? This was the glorified Christ that said this to his own people. But he loved them enough to say, repent and I'll restore you. Amen? But you see, beloved, the love of many would wax cold. Why? Because a believer can commit, now listen to me, iniquity. What did I say? Iniquity is not just sin or transgression of God's law. Iniquity is sinning against the light of God, the light of truth that you know. In other words, it's presumptuously sinning. I know that I shouldn't knock that door down, but I'm going to do it anyway. That would be what? Say it again. It would be what? That would be iniquity. I'm sinning against life, sinning against truth that I know, Sin, sinning against something that the Holy Spirit is already convicted of and stamped it on my heart. So, beloved, what I'm saying is this here. It's a very serious thing, not only for you right here, but hereafter to sin against the moral and spiritual light that you do know. Listen to me now. The Bible teaches of you. We're not only accountable for what we know, but we're accountable for what we should know if we had paid attention. Amen? Jesus said this, and I've seen this happen, that even that that you know, if you don't obey him, that which you know, he says, should be taken away from you. And I've seen that happen. I've seen it happen with seminary students who once started walking away from the Lord, and then the very things that they had been taught, they forgot. And they started going back and doing the things that they know they ought not to do. And it's with the grace of God that God restored them. What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying this. When we sit against the light of truth, beloved, then the colder his love, a person does that, gets for God. And the colder his love gets for Christ and the church. And the colder their love gets for praying, for a Bible study. The colder their love gets for fellowship with, and spiritual things. Why, beloved? Because the hotter his love for the flesh now gets. The hotter his love for the world and the sensual and the carnal now gets. The hotter his love for the concupiscence, that's that deep, inordinate affection for forbidden things that we know that we should not want, but yet we're doing it now because we have been led astray. And I'm going to speak more on that as we go along right here. You see, beloved, in the last days of earth's history, Satan is going to pull out all the weapons in his evil and infernal arsenal and seductively allure believers away from Christ with powerful temptations of the flesh that will convince them that it's all right. It's okay if you want to satisfy and gratify the flesh and the lusts of the flesh and the longings of the flesh. Why would the devil do that? The devil is a good general. Now listen to me, beloved. Anybody of you ever read Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War? It's required reading for every person that goes into special forces 
every military academy we have in the United States of America, and it's also being read throughout the world right now in their military academies. Sun Tzu, the art of war. Not only know yourself, he said, but know your enemy better. That's a great principle, isn't it? In fact, beloved, can you imagine this guy learned with a small army, he was with 30,000 men, he was able to lead armies that were 300,000 because he knew his enemy better than they knew him. So he knew where their weak spots were. He knew where to attack them, when to attack them, when to flank them, when to get them having mutiny amongst the ranks, amongst themselves, putting spies out, and things of that nature. You see, beloved, Satan knows that it's hard for a believer to constantly and continuously try to mortify and crucify the flesh as God commands and demands. And Satan knows that it's tough for a Christian to constantly die to himself or try to deny himself. And Satan knows that it's a full-time job for any saint to try to separate from this evil world system and try to keep God's commandments. Why? Because God's commandments put a moral and spiritual restraint around us. We just can't do what the world is doing. And yet many Christians still want to do that. And they think, and that's why Peter wrote this, because they once professed Christ as Savior and they had escaped, as we read this morning, that they can do it and still go to heaven. That's a fallacy, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you right now, as your pastor, that is a lie and it even smells like smoke right out of the pit of hell. It contradicts everything the Word of God has to say. Now, we, because of our fallen hearts, want to believe that because we have some Christians that are kind of teetering on both sides of the fence like this here, or we have family members that are teetering, or they say, well, I made a profession. Well, beloved, I want to tell you something. You need a biblical outlook uh, and not just a personal outlook on what's going on in the world. Amen? That's one of the things you try to teach Christians, how to have a biblical outlook on the world and not a personal or a worldly outlook. So Satan knows all these things. He's a great general, beloved. And the devil will inundate their minds with seemingly convincing and highly intelligent human arguments and reasonings and excuses that will cause many of them to doubt and disbelieve God's word and ultimately disobey God's commandments. And he will deceive them into believing that God really does not expect them to actually follow his word, will, and ways right to the letter. Oh, it's good. You may like it, but don't worry about it if you don't do it. Listen, beloved, it's, it's, it's like if you're boxing, you punch and you punch and you punch and you pound away until that guy gets tired enough. That's why you hit him in the arms, you hit him in the, you know, you, so he can't lift his arms up. By the fourth round, he can't even do what he's doing, and you drop him. And that's what Satan does. He pounds and he pounds and he pounds and he pounds, and all of a sudden he sees the person start, well, you know what, uh, it starts compromising little by little, amen? And he pounds away and he pounds away. That's the spiritual battle, isn't it? That's the war that we're in. A lot of Christians aren't even in a war. They think it was done the day they got saved. And yet they're so deceived, they don't know what's going on. And beloved, consequently, there's going to be terrible moral and spiritual apathy and ambivalence that's going to prevail in the church. And there's going to be terrible complacency and indifference in the church. And Peter tells us there's going to be great heresy and apostasy in the church, beloved. And this is expressly what Peter is talking about here. Throughout this epistle, he's talking about deception. He's talking about heresy. He's talking about moral and spiritual apathy. He's speaking about lukewarmness. The apostle Peter, uh, Paul said this in Titus 1.16. He says, they profess with their lips that they know God. Homo legeo is that word. Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, he said, but they deny him with their works and their life. People in the church will say, I believe in Jesus, I got saved, I did this. But homo legeo is that word. They profess to know Jesus, but they deny him with, his, with their works. And that's serious business, isn't it? With their works, their lifestyle, whether they obey the commandments of God, not works of merit, works of faith. Well, but I want you to look at 1 Peter, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Peter says this. Now watch what he says. But there are also false prophets uh, also among the people. That is the Old Testament people of Israel is what he's talking about. 
So he he's wants us to reflect back, to look back so we can see, understand what is going on in the present. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, that is in the church, the New Testament is real. He says, who shall bring, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. That word denying is the Greek word anoma, uh, anomai, and it means to disavow, to disregard what they already know about Christ, to disavow Him as their Lord in their life. In other words, they're not really so much doing it verbally as they are doing it in their life. I know what the Bible says, but I got my life to live. I want to enjoy life. This is what I'm going to do. That's what they're saying. They're denying him. Notice he says right here, beloved, even denying the Lord that bought them, beloved. In other words, they're denying the Lordship of Christ over them in their life. You are bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself anymore. Isn't that what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20? You don't belong to yourself. When I say you, that includes us. It's all-inclusive. We belong to the Lord now. We're His property. We're His peculiar people. And we mustn't forget that. We think that we just come to church on Sabbath and that's it. It's much more than that. It's what you're doing throughout the course of the week as God's watching you, whether you're doing your devotions, God's watching you, what you're saying, and what you, how you're living. Those things that you're doing, beloved, that mean something. I had a preacher one time say to me, how do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? I said, what you're doing on Sunday is what you're doing the rest of the week that God sees. How faithful you are to God during the rest of the week and how you're chasing after God and how you're praying and begging God for anointing of the Holy Ghost and have the unction, the hand of God upon you. What you're doing the rest of the week, discipline yourself to do that. I told them, God's power will be upon you. And people have very little discipline today anyways. Then he says, beloved, verse 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Ah, oh, don't worry about that. You don't really have to be that strict with God. Don't worry about that. You can do what you want and still go to heaven. They speak in evil of the way of what? God says, listen to me now, be ye holy, for I am holy, for no man without holiness will ever see God. Isn't that what he says? Read uh, 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 Hebrews chapter 12, I think it's around 13 or 14. Be ye holy, for I am holy, no man without holiness will ever see God. God made you holy when you get saved, he wrapped that garment of holiness around you. Now that you're filled with the Spirit of God and the grace of God, he expects you to start living holy, Amen. Because he's given you the power. Through faith you utilize that power so you can do it. And verse number three, he says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, watch what he says, make merchandise of you. Now that word merchandise, and for you, oh my, it means they're going to sell you like a commodity. They're going to take your money. They're going to sell you like a commodity. They make merchandise of you. Isn't that what the TV evangelists do right now? Buy this, buy that. So you see, you get a need. You'll make money. God will bless you. God will... See, they make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Now, beloved, here Peter reveals that one of the major causes of the final great apostasy is going to be false prophets, false preachers, false teachers in the church. They're going to arise from right within the ranks of the church, beloved, just like they did historically with Old Testament Israel, but now they're going to do it in the New Testament Israel, the church. In other words, history is going to repeat itself. Amen? That's why it's so important to study history. That's what I was telling you this morning about our decision. I look back at history, backward, which I can base my decision and go forward. You never, never, never know where you're going until you know where you've been. History has taught us a lot of things, hasn't it? And guided us as we've gone forward in our life. Praise the Lord. But anyways, beloved, he says that many, notice he says, are going to follow them. Jesus called them wolves in sheep's clothing. While in Acts 20, verses 29 and 30, Paul called them grievous wolves who'd enter it among them. And he said, not spare the flock, and of your own selves also would men arise speaking perverse things. Why? He says, to draw away disciples after themselves. Amen? You see, beloved, so false prophets and preachers and teachers would arise both within and without the ranks of the church. And then they'd preach and teach a smooth, ear-tickling, perverted gospel in an attempt to gather disciples unto themselves. 
but they preach another gospel. That's what Paul warned about in the church of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1. Another gospel, beloved. It's not the same one. It's a different Jesus. It's a different spirit. It's a different gospel. Also, beloved, not only would it be a different or another gospel, it would be a corrupt and a perverted gospel. It would be a man-centered gospel. Man is at the center of it, like uh, Joel Osteen's type of preaching. Positive thinking that he got from a lot of heretics that went on before him. You say, Pastor, that's pretty strong. That's right, because souls are on the line here. And Jesus named the people, Paul named the people that were heretics, beloved, and he said, beware of those people. Hymenaeus, Alexander, and I could go on, you know, the coppersmith. But I won't do that because I want to move right along right here. But you see, beloved, these people would lead many astray. They deceive them. In Matthew 24, 4, uh, 24 and verse 4, beloved, in, in verse 11, Jesus warned this. This is what he said. He said, take heed that no man deceive you. Pay close attention. Here's my warning to you. Here's the caution. Take heed. He says that no man deceive you. That's why I tell you to do what with me? Check me out. So I, don't, I could be deceived ignorantly, beloved. And if I am, I need to be corrected. But he said, take heed that no man deceive you. Why? He says, for many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. He didn't say any. He said what? Many. So the question is this here. How do you spot a false preacher or prophet and a false teacher? How do you do it? Well, Jesus told us, beloved. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. In other words, you have to examine their doctrine. Does their doctrine align itself with the word, will, and ways of God? That's number one. Number two, you're to study their deportment. What is their life like? Is it a holy life, a righteous life? What's their family like? And then you would study the part of that fruit as their disciples. Look at the people they're teaching. Are they holy? Are they righteous? Are they godly? Or are they carnal and are they worldly? So how do I determine a false preacher, a false teacher? I look at, number one, their doctrine, number two, their deportment, number three, their disciples. Amen? You will know them by their fruit. Take heed. And sadly, a lot of people aren't taking heed today. Now, beloved, today many popular so-called Christian pastors and teachers, today many popular so-called TV evangelists and teachers, many authors of books, someone said to me, have you read... Jonathan Kahn's latest book, I said, you mean Jonathan Kahn? Not Kahn, Kahn. The Harbinger, the Shemitah, all of those are, all the errors that have been in them, no one's called them the task for it, and they didn't come to pass yet. But people don't know their Bible, so therefore they say, oh, look at this, oh, I'm not going to be here anyways because the rapture's going to take me out, so, oh. They don't have a clue what's going on. Mostly these preachers speak about the love of God, and they speak about the grace of God, and the mercy of God, and the forgiveness of God, and the blessings of God, and I'm all for that. But they do that to stay exclusively on those subjects so they can gain followers, as Paul warned in Acts chapter 20. Gather disciples unto themselves. But beloved, this is a totally unbalanced, and it is a truncated gospel, for they scarcely ever mention the holiness, or the righteousness, or the justness, or the judgment of God. No one wants to talk about that. They say life's hard enough. It is hard, but it'll be even harder if you don't know the truth. Better be hard on this side of the veil than on the other side. What do you think? They scarcely ever mention about the absolute need for a person not only to repent of their sins, but from that day forward to start walking in a state of repentance to be finally saved. In other words, their heart has been changed right now. They recognize when they do wrong, and immediately they fess up. First John 1 John 1.9, you know the text. If we confess our sins, I don't have to quote it to you. I'm trying to stay within the time limits here. And they hardly ever mention the absolute necessity for Christians to continuously confess their sins to be forgiven. They give it the impression that, you know what, even if you don't do this, this just automatically happens whether you do it or you don't do it, and God just sweeps it under the rug. Well, I've got to tell you something. If you studied... To be a doctor, a lawyer, a, 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 a psych, whatever it is, like you're interpreting the scriptures, you would never reach your goal. You got to know the details, amen? You have to know the principles. If I can use an illustration, I never 
the years I've taught the martial arts and police, they say, what's this technique? I said, I don't teach techniques. They said, what? I said, I do not teach techniques. They said, what do you teach? I said, principles. If you know the right principle, there's a million techniques that can come out of it. If you don't know the principle, you're stuck just with the technique. So if you know 10 techniques, you know 10 things. But if you know the principle, there may be 100 things you can do out of that. Amen? So you have to know the principle. This is what God wants us to know, the principles and the precepts of the Word of God. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, they scarcely ever mention the absolute need to overcome or try to overcome and forsake our sin or live holy and righteous and godly lives or be faithful Christians and fruitful Christians. And they absolute need to be victorious in the spiritual battle, but especially, beloved, the absolute need to be mindful of the fact that Jesus came to save us from our sins and not in our sins. Amen? Christians think that they can just live in sin because they're under the grace of God. Let me tell you, beloved, now hear me now. What did I say for you to do? Hear me now. The requirements under grace are stricter than those under the law. Did you hear that? Because now, under grace, I have the power to be able to obey God from His Spirit and His grace. Would you say amen? You say, Pastor, you're scaring me. I'm trying to. I'm trying to scare you with the truth of the Word of God. So you don't get shaken in the wind like a reed as Jesus warned about again and again. And see, beloved, this is one of the express reasons that Christians today, because they're not being taught these things, they have no hesitation whatsoever, no reluctance about living in sin. Why? Because these false prophets, these false preachers, these false teachers, beloved, have removed all fear of God from before their eyes. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1.7 You see, beloved, that's why they preach these smooth and sinister things. They're trying to give people a false sense of security with God, beloved, but I'll tell you, it's a distorted picture of God. And they want you to think that he's just like some defanged, toothless tiger, beloved, who blesses everyone, judges nobody, and just kind of sweeps it under the rug and goes by. Does your Bible say that, beloved? Did did Jesus say man will give an account for every word he said in that day? Does he say that, or am I making that up? Tell me. Say amen. Not oh me. Amen. (laughs) You see, beloved, but the prophets... All the way back under the prophet Isaiah who spoke more about the coming of the Messiah, the servant of God, the son of God who was going to come. And all the way back yonder, beloved, in the Old Testament, when the prophet Jeremiah, they state that false prophets and false teachers say peace, peace, when there is no peace because they're trying to lull you to sleep. Oh, don't worry about that. Don't go to that church. Beloved, I'll tell you something. I'd rather go to a church that would shake the fire out of me, would be a burn my saddle, would challenge me every week, and I said, I'm going to try to prove that pastor wrong right now. And I'll tell you what, if I didn't prove him wrong and he was right, I'm going to be the first one in the front row say, preach it, preach it, preach it. How about you? Let it rip. Do what Jesus said. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itchy ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, Timothy. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. That's 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 through 8. They preach the word in season, out of season. That means when it's convenient and not convenient. I did a funeral in Wareham. And it was at a Nazarene church, but this woman had been watching us on television. And she says, I want Pastor Joel to do the preaching, do my funeral. So I did the funeral. And then to the, went to the committal service, and I preached again. There was all the people who were standing around like a gaggle of hens. And the Lord nudged my spirit, said, Joel, give him the gospel one last time. And I did. Beloved, this is the gospel. Five people repented. We went back to that Nazarene church and we baptized them. Five people repented out there in the cemetery 
And they said, Pastor, I want to speak with you. We went back to the church and we baptized them. God got a hold of them. Preach the word, preach the word, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. We don't like rebukes and we don't like reproofs. And I don't myself. I don't like to preach them. I don't like preaching messages like this, but it's needful that I do. Amen. So they say peace, peace, when there is no peace. Whereas the Bible teaches that real peace with God comes through surrender to His Lordship and authority in your life and submission to the human heart and will and the divine heart and will. That's when you get peace, beloved. Real peace comes through obedience to His commandments and conformity to His law as revealed in the Word. So Peter says that these false preachers and teachers will bring damnable heresies and many will follow their, notice what he says, pernicious ways. And they'll now deny the Lord that once bought them and set them free from their sin. And they'll now deny the lordship of Christ over them as the king of their life. They want to be their own king, their own queen over their life. And they'll now deny the authority of God's word, will, and ways in their life. And what will they do? They will replace it with damnable heresies and philosophies and uh, uh, spiritual cliches that are not true and cannot be found in the word of God. Like once saved, always saved. Sounds good, doesn't it? But I want you to look at verse 22. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Notice that professing believers who live such iniquitous lives like this, an immoral and idolatrous lifestyles, beloved, God says they're like dogs and hogs in my sight. Why? Because in Scripture... Dogs and hogs were considered unclean. They were abominable before a God. They were abominable before the children of Israel. Why is that, Pastor Joel? Because both of them were scavengers. They were bottom feeders, if you will. Because both of them were always running around dirty and filthy. Both of them were repulsive to both God and man. Beloved, listen to me now. Before we got saved... In God's sight, every single person in this room, those watching me by television, on YouTube, every single person in God's sight was as filthy as a barnyard dog and hog. Am I right? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all defiled by sin, all stained by sin. And God is a holy God. Beloved, so holy. Imagine, Jesus the second person of the divine triune Godhead was willing to forego all the worship of angels, worship of heaven, the beauty of the fellowship with his Father, and tiptoe across the Milky Way and take on human flesh to die for our sins because he saw how heinous hell was. Matthew 25, I think it's verse 48, God says uh, hell was made for Satan and his angels. God didn't make hell for man. But man will go there if he follows his leader, the devil. And the devil is never so stupid as to be obvious. He's not going to come in with two horns and flannel pajamas and a little mustache. <laughs> little mustache. <laughs> He's not going to come in like that and say, guess what, a fork tail and a pitchfork, like on devil ham? I'm the devil, follow me. Oh, no. He's going to sweet talk you. Hey, listen, you're covered by the blood of Christ. Don't worry about anything. You're under grace right now. You got it made. Oh, sure, you can't keep the law. Nobody can keep the law. Why did Jesus save me and say, keep thine commandments? <laughs> it should, maybe the hypocrisy of it just makes me, especially with leaders, beloved, I can't tell you when you see it. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. We were once covered with all kinds of sin, weren't we? We were bottom feeders. We, looked, we were scavengers. We lived off this evil world system. We did what they told us to do. We followed them. You know, right now, beloved, the Bible says people will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God in the last days. Do we see that? Everybody's got to be entertained. I've got to be entertained. I've got to be entertained. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. From such turn away, Paul says. But everybody's so lovely. We're so, we brought up in a society, beloved, that we love pleasure. And I'm not against pleasure. But the love of pleasure can be very, very dangerous in your life because then you expect it all the time. And then you start wanting pleasure more than you want God, and you start overlooking the moral and spiritual restraints and restrictions that God has put upon you. Amen? 
Jesus said before he comes, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the uh, days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And that day, unexpectedly, boom, the flood came. Jesus said, took them all away. Eating and going out to eat, going out to drink, going out, going out, going out. They're just living a good old time. Marrying, giving in marriage, divorce, remarriage, whatever. Things will always be the same. The sun will come up tomorrow. Nothing's, uh, nothing's going to change. Peter warns in the Bible right here, there'll be scoffers and mockers in the last day that will say that, amen? Where is the promise of it? Read chapter 3 today. Where is the promise of his coming? All things continue as they were since the beginning of the world, he says in chapter 3. Verse 5, for this they are willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But notice what he says in verse 4, beloved, uh, verse 3, in chapter 3 of Peter. He says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation, but he says they're willingly ignorant. Why are they willingly ignorant? Because they had the word of God. They were taught what happened, why the flood had to come. Now, beloved, I want you to picture this. Look at me. I don't even want you taking notes right now. This is an introduction. I'm going to give you three points next week. I want you to picture Noah. There's a lot of things that I don't understand about Noah. For example, I don't agree with this. I did a paper on this, but for the sake of argument, they say Noah, it took him 120 years to build the ark. It was impossible when you look at the genealogy, but say 120 years. Where did he get all the wood? That he had unsaved people working for him? Must have had, you think? Where did he get the pitch to hold it together? <laughs> yeah, no, no, we'll go cut this for you. You know what? And we'll, we'll help you build this, but you're wasting your time. God says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Amen? Let's say for 120 years, Noah was preaching to them, repent, you need to turn. Now picture this, beloved. Millions of people on the earth, eight are saved. Because God, he's looking through that translucent, Glass of heaven, as the Bible says. You can own almost like a two-way mirror. You can, you can see what's through it, but you can't see into it, right? But God's looking down like that, and he's watching every single solitary person. But God, in his mercy, gave him 120 more years to get it right. In other words, you know what he was saying? Listen to my preacher. Listen to Noah. He's telling you the truth. Listen to Noah. It's pretty scary, isn't it? Because we have a mindset that if everybody else is doing it, I might as well do it. I got nothing to worry about because they're all doing it. If you learn anything from this preacher in Scripture, it's always been the remnant. Amen? It's always been the remnant, beloved, that takes God seriously at his word and says, you know what, I'm going to live for God because I love God. And I'm not living because I just want to obey the commandments of God. I'm trying to obey the commandments of God out of love because I love my God. I love what he did for me. I love how he saved me. I love how he sacrificed for me. I love how he gave it all for me. The least I can do is start living my life for him. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying we were scavengers once. Lived in this world, but God washed us clean through the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he washed our bodies with pure water and baptism and cleaned us up. And when the Bible says that in the book of Hebrews, beloved, before they would ever offer a sacrifice, they would cut it up. If I was bringing my sacrifice, I would take my hands, lay it on this little sheep. Now, beloved, if you come to my house, right next door, we've got little sheep and little goats. They're the cutest things you ever saw. I weep when I look at them, and I say to my wife all the time, Ellie, can you imagine us ever putting one of those on the altar, cutting its throat, and then burning it? They're the cutest little things, like little puppies. But they transfer their guilt to that, and then the priest would take a knife, and you'd grab his hand, and you'd transfer your guilt into the guilt of that innocent little victim, typifying Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and you'd cut the throat of that little lamb. And it would shed its blood for you. The Bible tells us that when Jesus... 
when he resurrected, excuse me, when he was uh, crucified and he died, the Bible says that he went down to hell, or Hades is the word. In the center of the earth, there was a compartment. It was called Hades. It was the netherworld, the underworld. And the Bible says in Luke 16, there was a great gulf fixed. Those who do not believe in the coming of the Messiah, the promise of Genesis 3.15, that is the seed of the woman who was to come. When they died, they went to the uncomforted side of Hades, or Hades. Those who did believe that the Messiah was coming, that the seed of the woman was coming, they went to the comforted side of Hades. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, when Christ resurrected from the dead, he led captivity captive. He took their souls, brought them where? But he went down to hell, which we call hell, Hades, and he preached to the souls in prison. He said to the saints, the ones that had died believing the Messiah, I am the one you were looking for. Hey, hallelujah, glory to God. And he left captivity captive when he ascended to heaven. Took him with him, emptied that side. But he probably with tears in his eyes, looked at the other side, the uncovered, and said, you should have believed in me, you should have believed in me. I was, I am him, the seed of the woman. But you see, we take solace in numbers, don't we? I don't. Hey, beloved, listen to me. You should need the, if you know anything about special forces, six guys can raise a whole lot of hello, how you doing? <laughs> right? Sometimes a lot more than a company of soldiers can do. So, beloved, once we were hogs and dogs, but now God saved us. Amen. And, beloved, he made us part of the family of God. We're children of God. We're in the kingdom of God now. We're cleaned up by God. And he's saying to us, I don't want you to sully yourself anymore. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, now all things have become new. You are a new creation in Christ. Walk newly uh, before the Lord. New words, new life, new habits, new things. Don't follow the world. Dare to be a Daniel and stand by yourself if you have to. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? Listen carefully. God says, when you get saved, now I want you to separate from sin. I want you to separate from Satan. I want you to separate from this evil world system. Now, you can't go out of the world, Paul says, right? But let me give you an example of what he's talking about. Let's say I go to work and I got all heathens around me. Well, what I want to be able to do is maintain my testimony. I, I had a guy one time, before I became a pastor, I was a Christian, and they, they were using the Lord's name in vain. I said, excuse me, why are you doing that? And he said, well, that's the way I talk. I said, you can't express yourself any better than take the Lord's name in vain. He said, what are you, some saint? I said, yeah. <laughs> I may not look like much, but I am. <laughs> I said, so you can't separate from them like that. But you know what? If they said to me, hey, we're going to the bar tonight. We're going to have a beer, and all the guys are going to be there. I'd say, thank you for offering, but I'm not going. Oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Thank you, but I'm not going. I have a higher standard of living. I have someone else that's higher than you that I must answer to. There's a Lord of my life. How about you? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that anyone or anything that tries to separate you from the Lord or feed you a bill of goods or tell you you don't have to live holy or tell you that you, you don't have to walk in grace or tell you any of those things, God says that you need to get away from that person. Now listen to me. You can always tell the measure of a man by looking at their enemies. If you've got someone that's really pressing down on you, and they're a very um, notable, highly educated person, you know that this person must be something. Amen. He must be telling this person right where it is, and this person that's doing that doesn't care a whit about his credentials, and I don't care about credentials one whit either. Only in so much... I said, a person that has credentials, it shows me they spent the time, energy, and effort to be able to earn those credentials. How about you? So I respect that. But you can have all the credentials in the world to be a liar, a cheat, a thief, and not know anything, just be pushed through the system. Amen? We've all seen people like that. They're doing that in school today. Kids can't read, they can't do math or whatever, but we don't keep anyone back now. See, we just push them along. Did any of you see the news the other night when they said American skills in math and science is down 30%? from the rest of the world, where Chinese are up about 30%.
because they grill them that way. They don't give this woke or this CRT or they're trying to indoctrinate them and, and that kind of stuff. Beloved, they're just doing communism. But communism stresses education. Well, beloved, I got a few minutes here, but let me just say this. I got three minutes. When a person goes back into the world and refuses all of the overtures of God and all the attempts of the Holy Spirit to restore them, finally the Holy Spirit turns them over to themselves. Go ahead and do it. And I told you, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. You don't come to Jesus just when you want to. Amen? Peter understood this, beloved. Because if that happens, you're no longer a saint of God. You're no longer a son of God. You're no longer, ladies and gentlemen, heir of God. Now you're a sinner before the Lord, beloved. Now you're much more accountable before God because you knew better. You had the knowledge, the epignosis or epignosis. I told you, depending on how you want to look at it. That's the precise, intimate knowledge of God that Peter stresses throughout the... Read it today. It's only three chapters. See, check me out. That's what I tell you to do. Beloved, I want you to look at 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'll close with this. Verses 8 through 11. Peter says, For if these things be in you, what things? Well, in verses 4 through 8, in other words, he's saying to him, Exceeding great precious promises, beloved. And verse 5, giving all diligence to make your faith in virtue and virtue, knowledge and knowledge, temperance and temperance, patience and goodwill and godliness and brotherly charity, beloved. If these things be in you and abound, they make you, uh, uh, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. And here's the word again, knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. In other words, he's short-sighted. Listen to me now. They got saved, but they lost sight of heaven. They lost sight of eternal life. They just said, I got saved one time and I can just do my thing. And then he says, and had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Beloved, notice sh they have a short memory. They forgot what God saved them from and what God saved them to. And he says, beloved, that they were purged from their old sin. You see that word purged? That's not a present tense verb, is it? It's showing right here, ladies and gentlemen. That word purged, katharismos, means to be once washed and cleansed from the guilt of the sins by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a past tense verb. He's talking to Christians right here. And he says in verse number 10, Wherefore the rather, brother, give diligence. There's that word again, used three times in the book of, of uh, 1 Peter. To make your calling and election sure. Bebeos. That Greek word. Make it firm. Make it secure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. That is from your calling and from your election. First Peter, excuse me. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. In other words, don't be so overconfident that you think you can go out and do what you want to do and not have God divinely intervene in your life. Verse 11, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you listening? Have you made your calling and election sure? Are you doing that on a daily basis? I pray you say, Amen, preacher, I am. Beloved, next week we're going to look. Just ran out of time at the insipid and deadly filthy uh, process of how an impenitent worldly backsliding Christian who once enjoyed all the high and holy privileges and prerogatives and blessings from God can be so deceived by false, teach false teachers and preachers, so deceived by their own heart and their own sins that they now degenerate into a dog and hog once again and ultimately if they don't repent they'll lose their soul. Next week, I'm going to show you three points about that. So, beloved, you can see, I challenge you today, it'll take you five minutes to read 2 Peter. Three chapters. See everything he has to say, and listen to when he says, it's needful that I put you in remembrance of this. It's needful that I put you in remembrance of this. What am I doing? I'm trying to do what to you? Put you in remembrance of this. Not too many, you don't see too much, too much about this kind of preaching on the TV, on the, on the radio, do you? Why? 
Somebody's got to pay for the radio station. You know what's amazing to me? The whole Roman Empire was conquered without a TV set. It was conquered without satellites. The whole Roman Empire went into England. Now, lie me, you know, Governor. <laughs> without cell phones, and I'm not against these things, beloved, I'm just telling you, but you know how they did it? Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Right? You're sharing it one person to another. I take on a rock, bloop, it goes into the water, the rock goes down, and the ripples spread out. Um, not circular, there's a, there's a word for that, I forgot. <laughs> anyway, you can see those ripples spreading out, right? That's what Christianity is. That's what the Great Commission is. One, you don't have to worry about, am I going to go over here, am I going to go over there, whatever. The important thing is, wherever you go, share the gospel. Share the gospel with your neighbor. Let him bask in godly favor. Right? Share the love of Christ with them so they can come to the Lord. Next week, we're going to get into some serious Bible study. So you want to come back for part two so you can follow in the Word of God. Next week, take notes. But I wanted to lay a good foundation for you today. I want you to check me out, and I want you to go home and read 2 Peter today. Chapter 1, 2, 3. Sweet and to the point. Amen? Amen? And when you're doing it, say, you know what? Did pastor say these things today? Okay? You do that for me? If you don't, I'm not coming back next week. All right, let's go to the throne of grace.